I grew up in Kentucky. I uh, was actually born on uh, Kinchler Air Force Base in Rudyard, Michigan. My dad was in the service and uh, we wound up in Kentucky, so I grew up there. Um, went to, lived in Louisville, Kentucky for a brief period of time and then moved out to, uh, to Nelson County, Kentucky. I went to high school there and then I moved to Carbondale. In high school, probably my junior year, I got uh, recruited by the Marine Corps to uh, go into something called the uh, Marine Corps Platoon Leaders Program. And uh, their basic sales pitch was uh, they didn't care what you did during the year, they just wanted you for the summers. I was interested in, um, in maybe going into the service and um, they, had a, they had a flight track, they had some other options. So I was, uh, I was being recruited for that and then when I went to, uh, when I went to college uh, at Southern Illinois University down in Carbondale, um, I thought that I would check around and I went in and talked to the ROTC detachment and um, looked at their scholarship opportunities and it, it just seemed like a better fit and a, a better deal all the way around. So that's when I enrolled into uh, ROTC. That was in 1984. I have 32 years commissioned. I was commissioned in May of 88 and then I've been in the Illinois Guard since February of 1990. So that's 30 years in the Guard. I'm only halfway kidding when I tell people that I never expected to live past 30 or make captain. And, you know, as a young captain, um, again, I wasn't thinking long range. And, you know, you turn around twice and I've got, um, I'm in command, I'm married, I got a kid on the way. Uh, so I think one of the things that I've told them is to, you know, don't discount it. Uh, get in and see how you like it. And if you're good at it, especially if you're good at it, then we need you to stay. One of the things I used to talk to cadets about when I had cadets that worked for me when I was a battery commander, um, there was a perception that, uh, you know, there's the real army out here and that we're over here doing something else. And that's not the case, you know. This is the real army and that new lieutenant that new E5, they're in the real army. There's not a separation either by component or job skill. Um, we can't afford to have jobs that don't serve a purpose, so it's all real. And I didn't, I didn't understand that as a, as a, you know, a lieutenant that wasn't even done with college yet. When I went through ROTC and I sat down with my evaluator at the end of my six weeks and he's going through his notes, he said, you know, we got to do all this enumeration and I got to quantify everybody. He said, but the bottom line is, if you were my younger brother's platoon leader, would I be comfortable with that? And if, if you met that criteria, then you were good to go. And if you didn't, he was going to cycle you out. It's got incredible responsibility to it, but it's really only to three things. That's the soldiers, uh, the Constitution, and the national interest. And uh, that sounds like a lot, but, uh, you know, one of the bumper stickers we throw around is soldiers first, mission always, and that kind of encapsulates all of that. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing is probably write things down. That's incredibly hard to get junior people to do. They want to record everything or they assume everything's going to be in digits. And uh, a notebook can be a really powerful leadership tool. father was in the Air Force in, uh, in the, the middle part, late part of the Vietnam era. He was a missile maintenance man. Um, and he, uh, he recently passed away from service-related issues that had to do with Parkinson's disease. Um, and I know that he was um, extremely proud uh, of what I was doing. Um, my mother um, watched her brother go off to Vietnam and come back. Uh, I know that, that she's very proud. Um, my uncle that went to Vietnam, also incredibly supportive. Overall, it's made us stronger as a family. You know, my wife did, uh, did a wonderful job stepping up and, you know, holding down the house. So it hasn't been easy, but I think they're, they're proud of their service as well you know families also serve and it's a really big deal i know that i wouldn't have been anywhere near as successful in my own career or have been able to contribute to the missions of the organization uh, as well as i did uh, 
if I hadn't had their, their backing and support. We as service members, and this is going to sound like a line from a speech because I say it a lot, but we as service members can't do what we do or what we need to do if we don't have the support or at least the tolerance of our family and loved ones. And we can't, uh, when we deploy, the last thing we really need to be worried about when we're trying to do a job overseas is, is what's going on at home. And it's not just the, our immediate family, but that entire support network. And it is, uh, it is vastly more difficult for those service members that don't have that support network, uh, either their own family or the people that surround that family back home, you know, to include all the service organizations and everything else. My intent is to uh, take a few months and get things caught up at home and spend some time with the family. And uh, I would really like to figure out, you know, I mentioned that mentorship piece, how to figure out maybe to get into some type of higher education work uh, with veterans or, or some kind of military program and, and kind of help continue, you know, continue that effort. Um, but I'm honestly not sure. Now, I have uh, the reason that I wound up at school in Carbondale is because of their art department. I have a Bachelor of Fine Arts in Jewelry and Metalsmithing. I've been a blacksmith since I was 14. So 40 years of, of experience and now I'm going to have more time to focus on on that and, and make art and hopefully sell a little bit of it. I don't expect to make a living at it, but um, that'll be something that occupies a fair amount of my time.